My name is Minerva Garcia, one of the co-facilitators of the Latinx Theater Alliance Los Angeles. I, along with the other co-facilitator of our organization, Black Gambel Chor, welcome you all to our convening, Awake and Activate. Before we begin our kickoff event, honoring and celebrating the legacy lessons of theater artist Diane Rodriguez, I want to take this moment to acknowledge that I stand on the land belonging to the Tongva, the original people of this region. If you know whose indigenous land you stand upon, please take a moment to make your own acknowledgement to the original peoples of Turtle Island. Thank you for being here tonight. I want to give a brief history of Latinx Theater Alliance Los Angeles. Founded in 2012, LTALA is an ad hoc group of individual artists and professionals led by a steering committee of practitioners from LA and Orange County. Our goal is to share our rich culture on the national stage by fostering collaboration and empowering our local artistic communities. LTALA produces convenings, public workshops, and the Writer's Circle, which incubates new works by emerging playwrights while providing access to established playwrights. Awake and Activate will be our third convening we produce. The theme of this year's convening emerged from the devastating policy agenda that sprung from the occupant in the White House against the Latinx community. With a refugee migrant crisis at our southern border, the indifferent response of this administration to the people in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria hit, the unimaginable pain inflicted on the people of El Paso, the Latinx people of El Paso a year ago, and now our community being unduly affected by COVID-19, the uprisings against police brutality, the Black Lives Matter movement. LTALA wanted to provide a space for our members to bear witness and explore how we, off, how we as artists can meet this unprecedented moment. We chose to offer three workshops in writing, performance, art, and actos as a way to provide our members with an opportunity to find their voice during this revolutionary moment. Sadly, 2020 also brought us here today. After losing Diane Rodriguez recently, <clears throat> excuse me, after losing Diane Rodriguez recently, LTALA wanted to honor one, hour, one of our own, our dear friend, because she is one of us. She gave the very first keynote speech at the first convening for LTALA in 2013. It is only fitting that we come full circle now to return the favor by dedicating our opening event to Diane. And for all those friends and colleagues who loved her, thank you for being here. Without further ado, here's Patricia Garza, who will take it from here. Thank you so much, Minerva, just for who you are and for also gifting us this amazing space. Friends, I cannot say how sacred this space is tonight. And I thank all these amazing folks on this panel, but also all of you as well for taking time on your Friday to remember a legend, Diane Rodriguez. My name is Patricia Garza. I have shared an office with Diane for six years of my 12 year tenure at Center Theater Group in here in Los Angeles. We worked side by side supporting and developing work as did Malcolm, which we'll hear from later today. I hold many creative spheres during the day, but I also have a deep passion and dedication for conversations around anti-racism and inclusion nationally. I want to acknowledge the moment we are in together of collective challenge and collective pain. And I want to say Black Lives Matter. I know throughout this conversation, we will be touching on Diane's amazing history of fighting for equality throughout her career. I'm also wearing some red lips for her as her infamous red lip. Um, and Deborah and Olga joined me on that tonight. Shifting gears slightly, just some tech notes. Please make sure your video is off throughout the entire um, presentation. So that way we can make sure to spotlight the panelists and uh, hear them clearly. We will invite folks to turn their cameras on later in this session when we take questions. And I will go ahead and mark when we do that. 
if you feel comfortable being seen. <laughs> we also encourage gallery view, which on, is on the upper right-hand corner, so you can see folks uh, nice and clearly in those beautiful squares. Uh, this event is also being live streamed on HowlRound, and we thank the Latinx Theater Commons and HowlRound for your support, and it will be recorded for folks to see at a later time. Uh, throughout the session, you can go ahead and put questions in the chat on if you're joining us on Zoom, if you're joining us on HowlRound, on any of the social media channels, we will have support there um, taking and kind of filtering questions to us back here over at the Zoom. So feel free to do that at any time, but we will have a portion for Q&A at the end. I also want to acknowledge not just Minerva, but Blanca, Mercedes, and Anthony, who have our kind of tech support, our backbone, who really helped support us and Thea from HowlRound. So just some short introductions, and then we're going to get started. Um, many of you tonight will know Diane. I hope that's why you're here. <laughs> but just in case, for those of us who need a refresher of her awesomeness, um, I have to be brief. So I only picked a few things to highlight, but I could go on all night. <laughs> Diane is a celebrated member of the Los Angeles theater community. She was an actress, a director, a playwright, producer. Her career began in 1973 when she joined Luis Valdez's El Teatro Campesino. She went on to become associate artistic director for Center Theater Group and worked with theaters and artists across the country, as well as internationally. She was the president of Theater Communications Board, was inducted into the College of the Fellows for the American Theater in 2018, and appointed by President Obama to the NEA's National Council of the Arts. She was also the co-founder of the groundbreaking comedy troupe Latins Anonymous and a member of the International Director Circle, which explored work on a global scale. Fun fact, and I always love sharing this with folks, she also worked for Mattel as the book writer for the Broadway style musical Barbie Live, which toured Asia in 2013 and Latin America in 2010. She was also the creative and cultural consultant for the Disney television animation series, Elena of Avalor. Is there nothing this woman did? <laughs> Diane is survived by her wonderful husband who's here with us, um, Jose Delgado, her mother, Helen Rodriguez, her niece, Gabrielle Fusco, nephew, Mario Fusco, and brother-in-law, Gary Fusco. So I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge them. But her, le her legacy is large and is present here in the room with us. We are a small group, the folks on this panel, of Diane's family and friends who supported her throughout her two-year diagnosis of cancer. Affectionately self-named Team Diane, we continue to come together to ensure her legacy lives on. With that, I will get to introductions right now to introduce these amazing folks, but I also want to acknowledge the three other members of Team Diane who gave up space for this conversation to happen tonight. Dolores Chavez, Amy Handelsman, and Paulina Sahagun. Thank you. All right, getting on to the bios. <laughs> um, starting with, of course, JD, my dear friend. Jose has 45 years of experience in theater and artistic management as general manager, tour manager, administrator, producer, and business manager. He was a member of the Teatro Campesino and currently sits on their board of directors. He is currently the producing director of Ojai Playwrights Conference as well as owner of Pliedas Management, where he manages Mariachi Sol de Mexico and Mariachi Reines de Los Angeles. He is Diane Rodriguez, devoted husband of 43 years. Thank you for being here, JD. We love you. Let me introduce Olga Garay English next. Olga has been an independent arts consultant since 2014, working on California-based national and international projects. She has been a senior advisor for international affairs for Fundación Teatro Amil and is the renowned Festival Internacional Santiago Amil in Chile. In 2016, she was appointed executive director of the Ford Theaters and from 2007 to 2014, Olga was executive director of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. As founding program director for the arts for the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, Ms. Caray English was responsible for one of the largest national arts funders in the US. She was awarded over $145 million to arts organizations in the US and abroad 
during her nearly eight year tenure. Prior to that, she was executive director of Miami, Miami, um, sorry, the daddy. I'm not saying that correctly. <laughs> Olga will correct me later. <laughs> College's cultural affairs department, where as a performing arts presenter, she focused on presenting work from local, national, and international BIPOC artists who represented Miami's diverse communities. Thank you so much for being here, Olga. Moving on to my dear friend, Malcolm, a senior, a uh, Malcolm Darrell, a senior creative director with 20 plus years under his belt, Malcolm has enjoyed collaborating with Ebony Repertory Theater, Cal Performances, uh, Cornerstone Theater Company, the Association of Performing Arts Professionals, Center Theater Group, uh, Yale Repertory Theater, Berkeley Repertory Theater, National New Play Network, and Teatro Campesino. <laughs> Presently, he leads the Live Entertainment Advanced Development Studio for Walt Disney Imagineering. There, he is a creative strategist and thought leader researching and developing new ways of delivering live entertainment to Walt Disney Parks globally. Love you, Malcolm. And last, but certainly not least, in the slightest, is our esteemed guest, Deborah J.T. Padilla. Deborah is infused with a deep understanding and commitment to socially relevant, activist-minded, diversity-driven organizations believing art can be a tool for social change and self-transformation. Honored to have served as executive director of Spark for 25 years and managing director of Borderlands Theater for seven years. Borderlands is where she and Diane met in 1991 in Tucson, Arizona. Deborah served for 14 years on the board of Cornerstone Theater. She is the chair emeritus of the board of directors for Arts for LA where she served eight years on the board and nine months as interim executive director. She is principal of hashtag Padilla Consulting slash partner currently and is currently working as the senior advisor of Heidi Deckler Dance. Wow, you all, <laughs> we have a panel tonight. <laughs> Diana surrounded herself with amazing, brilliant minds. But before we begin tonight, I also wanna take a moment to acknowledge and bring into this space Olga's dear husband, Dr. Kerry English, who left us this year as well, only two weeks after Diane, who was himself an avid supporter of the arts and culture here in Los Angeles. We honor Carrie as well tonight. Thank you, Olga. So we thought it would be fun if we played a video. So as Minerva was saying, Diane was the keynote speaker of our first Latinx Theater Alliance of Los Angeles convening. And we apologize if the audio is a little grainy, it's a little, you know, filmed in the corner. <laughs> but it's her words and her presence like bounce off of the video. And we wanna bring her into this space tonight. So I'm going to invite Mercedes if you wanna take us into the video. I think we're having a little bit of audio issues, so we're gonna stop and start again. Thank you for your patience. Don't you love Zoom? <laughs> Three stories, three observations, three mantras. Story one, the Hackney Brothers. When do you give a little so that you can take a lot? Note, I'm not talking about compromise or selling out. I am not talking about cheating or stealing. I am talking about strategic give and not giving in. I'm talking about having a little give in order to achieve your goal. 
Too many of us don't want to compromise our vision. And what I am doing here is acknowledging that all of you in this room today have vision. And what I am, uh, uh, and, and, and you wouldn't be here if you didn't. Contemporary Latino theater would not exist for 50 years without your vision. But so many of us hold on stubbornly to the fact, to the first draft. And I use that metaphorically. The Hackney brothers were brilliant, obviously, and I would think that their goal was to have their music heard. Couldn't these smart guys who had vision come up with another name they, that, that would have been equal or more brilliant than death to satisfy themselves and the record companies while achieving their greater goal? I'm an ideas person. Everyone that has worked with me knows that. I get it from my dad, Jake Rodriguez, who was always calling me and saying, I have an idea, and I was like, oh my god, what now? <laughs> <laughs> and it was always some idea about circumventing my mother and trying to get her to do something she didn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so, so in the spirit of my father, uh, I really enjoy pitching ideas. And I'm not hurt if you don't like my ideas, because I have another one. <laughs> and I'm kind of a pest with the ideas, and I know I'm annoying. But I've trained myself to just let them flow. I don't censor myself. So what I'm saying about Sam and the two other brothers is that they didn't trust that they would have a better idea. Believe and the ideas will flow. Give a little. For example, playwrights. We all know playwriting is about rewriting. If you don't know that, or if you are a playwright who refuses to rewrite, your career is reflective of that, and I am so sorry. <laughs> Find people who you trust, whose work you admire, and who is admired by others, and seek their opinion. And I'm not talking about Foncha down the street. <laughs> I mean, I talked to Foncha, and she really liked my play. <laughs> Honey, how many plays has Foncha seen? <laughs> you are a professional. Get a professional opinion. Now, I have to admit that sometimes I resent people who do give me those, even if I ask for them. Usually they want me to change something, and usually they are right. It will make my work better. So you are in control of your vision, and believe that if you change your work with the goal of improving it, you will retain it. See Stone, story two. Now, the most talented artist the most brilliant, the most natural, need drive, ambition, and a business sense. Now, you don't have to be the most talented, the most beautiful, the best poet, the richest organization, have the best building, the most people working for you, but you do need drive and ambition. Don't be embarrassed by that or deny it. You have to be competitive. And being competitive is about excellence. Now, excellence is a tough word for me. Who determines who's excellent or not? When I was in the teatro, I had to act next to Socorro Valdez. <laughs> to this day, one of the two best actresses I have ever worked with. She she was an inspiration. She was excellent. She could act like a man, better than a man, <laughs> do a backflip, and then let out a sorrowful wail that would chill your back. Brilliant. But she burned out early, not interested in pursuing an artistic life. And me, the one with the tiny voice, to balance the not-so-tiny body, who wasn't very deep, who mugged and overacted, <laughs> had the career. I wasn't excellent, but I had drive. And I could sense that I had presence. So in order to raise the bar for myself, I had to change. 
And I did that by listening to people I trusted because I wanted a life in the theater so badly. See still? His tape? If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If the door is closed, I'll just go in the opposite direction and do something else. That was fine for him. But for me, and many of you, no. If the door is closed, you go around and you look for another door, and if you cannot find a door that is open, then you open one yourself, and you keep it open for others to go through. Randy McDonald, subvert the rules. I love this story. It's so fun. I love breaking the rules. It's it's the chola in me. <laughs> and and this dude, Randy McDonald, subverted the rules for the greater good, right? And that is cool. <laughs> now, I spent 18 years at a very large not-for-profit not, not, not organization. I can't even get it out. <laughs> and so many times I find myself resisting the tried and true ways. Because honestly, I am not interested in embracing the status quo, though I have worked at a, at a various a, a hardcore establishment. I, I commit private acts of subversion. <laughs> and I would, and they would no longer be private if I shared them with you. <laughs> you can see that I cut all this. <laughs> It does make me happy. It, it gives me peace. And that's why uh, I have managed to say at a, at a very large, uh, well-respected, oh my god, that's my niece, uh, <laughs> uh, a very large and, and respected but corporatized uh, theater. And to CTG's credit, uh, they have made room for my subversion. Uh, I acknowledge that I'm an insider who is an outsider, that I sit at, at the table as a rebel who can politic, that my job is to challenge, to tell the truth. I choose because I can and when I can, what meetings I have to attend to and those I don't. If I feel my soul will be crushed or my heart broken, I will not go. If I feel like my spirit will be dulled or my hope dashed, you will not see me at the table. I sit at the table because I am hopeful, hopeful for change, but I never let myself get too comfortable. That's in general, and that is hell. Discomfort makes me move, change, grow, activate, do. So three stories, three observations, three mantras, have give while competing and breaking the rules. Thank you, Mercedes. Thank you so much. I just want to take a collective breath hearing her presence and her words was just, yeah, it's very meaningful to, to talk about this and to hear her. Yeah. So folks, three mantras. When do you give a little so you can take a lot? The most talented artists need drive, ambition, and business savvy. <laughs> Subvert the rules. We'll be kind of coming back to these mantras throughout our conversation. First, I'm sure it was very emotional to hear her voice in this space and to see her presence. And I wanna thank all of you for being here today, but I particularly wanna acknowledge JD 
on kind of his first public uh, <laughs> outing here. Um, and we talked about this before, so I'm not putting him on the spot, but I did wanna make space if you had anything you wanted to share with folks before we really dived into the questions. Oh, th thank you, thank you, uh, Patricia. Um, the, the only thing I think I, I can say is uh, thank you Minerva and Patricia for those very moving opening remarks. Um, and uh, also just the community at large uh, for all the condolences and uh, generous notes. Um, you've all been very, very kind and generous. And um, uh, you remind me also of the generosity that uh, Diane extended to many, many of her colleagues uh, and friends in the community. Um, and uh, I, I also just want to thank also the Latinx Theater Alliance for um, actually conceiving and putting on this, this, uh, this event. Um, and also to let people know that, you know, we're all sort of, all her friends and family are still waiting for closure uh, at a certain level. Uh, and we're, we're hoping that we can do uh, a, an in-person, you know, um, celebration of life um, that would allow people to, you know, share stories and, and anecdotes and that kind of a thing. But um, with this uh, pandemic, uh, it's been obviously impossible. Um, this is a, has been a, a period, I think, just generally speaking, uh, internationally or universally of, of, um, of uh, uh, reflection. And um, uh, the nature itself is, is sort of doing its own cleaning if you will, and is, is telling us that um, we really should um, be aware of how sick the planet is. And, um, and I think that, that people have had time to reflect on, in this country, racism, um, social injustice, and um, have really allowed themselves to really ponder um, how that is, uh, how that is how that is toxic, not only for our society. Um, and I think artists are also taking note. And uh, Diane, Diane wrote this article as, as Team Diane knows, um, that resonates strongly at this time um, about the elitism that's taking place on board of directors and in large uh, arts institutions, not, not just performing arts, but also in museums um, and how that, that uh, that paradigm is old. And her mantra at that time uh, was reform or perish. Mm -hmm. And um, that seems to be um, a part of this mantra here where you're talking about how do you get a little to, and gain a lot, right? Absolutely. Um, but also just in general, um, the last two years of her life uh, were full um, and uh, she purposely did not want to, you know, let out that she was ill uh, because she didn't want that to be a deterrent for not only herself, but also her friends to treat her in a different light. Um, with the limited time that she had, uh, she kept it full. And um, there were prospects for a lot of projects in the future. And that work is left undone. And that, that, that undone, you know, so those undone projects or incomplete projects now have to be taken up by um, the younger generation and people that are watching, you know, this program. Um, and uh, again, um, we had a year and a half of dialogue uh, in preparing us for the ultimate, but really uh, nothing, there is no handbook. <laughs> and, and, and ultimately when, when she had her stroke in, uh, in San Jose, that was really the beginning of her demise. And this is stuff that we'll talk about I think at the celebration. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. um, but um, today, this is this is uh, this is uh, uh, this. Is, you honor her um, by uh, uh, acknowledging uh, some of the precepts and principles that she has passed on to uh, you as as individuals and uh, Team Diane and the panelists here. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it back up to you. Bring it back up to you, Monica. Patricia, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, JD, for those beautiful words and for letting us um, letting us know that she did have a really full two years. I mean, I can tell you because I shared an office. <laughs> I, know, 
<laughs> never saw her. She's always out and about. Um, I did want to acknowledge where the video, I think we were getting some questions about where the video came from. So we actually have been playing clips of the video throughout, they will be playing clips of the video throughout the convening and maybe uh, Minerva and I could touch base about how to share that out more publicly in terms of the entire keynote. That was just 10 minutes of a 40 minute keynote. Yes, we can tell you that in a moment. Oh, perfect, okay, great. Um, but first I want each panelist um, and JD, we'll start with you. Um, and then um, we'll kind of kick it around. Um, but first I would love to start with just hearing from each panelist um, and asking a quick gut, like one minute gut check, which mantra really stuck with you after rehearing uh, them again um, and why? And, and, and maybe how that reflected with Diane's legacy. So JD, do you want to kick us off? Well, I mean, the first, the first one about uh, giving, giving a little to, to take a lot. I mean, that certainly, um, it was something that she learned uh, in the teatro, the teatro campesino, because um, there was this idea of uh, of, of your work uh, having cause. Um, it was all about the causa, right? Whether or not the causa was uh, uh, specifically about the the farm workers movement, about social justice, about your community, and um, uh, all of the inspiration came from uh, actually that that purpose. Um, and, uh, and the artwork that was created also in, in the teatro was really about more the collective, uh, uh, the collective collaboration, the collective creation. Um, and so there was a lot of, of give and take where, you know, there were improvs and the improvs eventually turned into the writing and then the writing ended up being staged. And then you, everybody was involved in the design of it. You know, we had a visionary leader in Luis Valdez who, you know, has a huge mind and it was, and he was the one that put these together. And um, in the improv, I think we talked about this earlier, in an improv, um, there's a give and take, a give and take. There's a, there is a, a duality, there is the dialectic. And the moment the improv ends is when somebody says no. Um, and, and thus the creative, the creative muse is gone. Um, so she understood that. And she understood also um, that um, um, giving a little to take a lot it, in the in the sense of the improv, this is what you get. Activate you activate mm. through through um, through movement. You activate through uh, being generous, right? Uh, you activate by including others in your process. Um, and um, this is not only true for actors, but it was also true for 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 directors. And and directors, she took that into into her direction. Um, um, when, when, when she'd work with actors, what is the strength and the weakness of this actor? How, how do you activate this actor? How do you get the yeah. actor to activate the script, right? Um, or the scene. Um, so there is that as well. But, um, but basically I think they're all really tied in. They're all so interconnected, um, uh, right. Patricia, that um, uh, where, where, where her generosity of spirit was that she always believed uh, that and, and it's, this is a, a problem with some colonized minds is that you, your success uh, is my failure. Right. And in her, in, her, in her belief, it was your success is my success. Mm. Um, so- Yeah, that know, generous spirit, right? Yeah, no, totally. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's, that's, the way, that's the way she always thought. And um, right. you know, it was def very difficult as, as you may know, you attest and also Malcolm, to be in a situation sometimes in a large institution with the set like the center theater group um with all its microaggressions and you know all of that where you have to sit down and sort of pick your fight um there's just something you know and it's 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 imbued within the spirit it's just uh, of racism and all of that and we live with that and um uh, 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 she never hated anybody um, her, her colleagues were her colleagues, even at that That's level. Right. And I'm telling you, there were times where, you know, she'd come in and she'd be moping and I go, what's going on? I says, no, nothing, nothing. Yeah. And I know it was work related, you know? So there's a lot of pillow talk, right? So, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, you, and you know, and, and most of you have partners know when something bothers your partner, it's like something that you need to talk about and you sort of draw it out of them as best you can. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, it was all always never about herself personally, uh, really more about an idea, an idea gets kicked because they don't understand it. An idea gets thrown out because it's potentially not 
uh, they don't want to invest the resources in it. Mm. Um, so yeah, what, what, the thing that we learned in the theatrical was that you can create miracles. And how do you create miracles? The miracle is that you create something out of nothing. Um, uh, and, the, and the resources always limited with small theater companies. Um, and how, how you're able to use something creatively. I mean, where you see something, um, uh, something as, as a trash and turn that trash into something that turns into a jewel, right? Right. No, um, I hear that. Yeah. And um, uh, that that's that's part of her DNA and the money, the money and resources in that sense. You know, I, I, and I told you, uh, yeah, I think I, we talked. About yes, this. we talked about the story. You should share. <laughs> you know, people don't realize that the theater was was uh, um, in terms of finances was formed after the model of the United Farm Workers and there's and they're striking workers. And uh, at the time, the striking workers were given food and housing and an allowance of five dollars a week. Right. This was in the 60s. Well, the Teatro ended up developing somewhat a similar parallel structure, only we were paid, we were paid $60 a month and had our food and housing covered. And um, and then eventually, like when Diana and I got together, we got $100. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> <Spirit> <laughs> night. <laughs> but um, I mean, you know, somebody told, told me once, well, you guys are funding the group. And, you know, I thought I talked to uh, Pauline and I had a discussion about this just yesterday. She's like, no, you were taking so much more from that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's true. The experience of um, working together uh, in a unified cause and moving together and moving forward. Um, most people don't know that the first experience with international groups uh, came through the Teatro. And this mm -hmm. is with Diane. I mean, the company toured, used to tour Europe at least every other year. Uh, and uh, we were included in, in a, in a um, we were included in um, a touring uh, circuit that involved all these international theater companies. They looked at us as colleagues. Uh, now, we were never given that recognition in this country uh, in terms of our artistry, but we were outside and it was extremely validating. Um, so there's that. And um, that later, that later was an easier fit for, for her to go back into the international thing later with, uh, through the help and uh, the inspiration of Olga. And she can talk about that um, mm -hmm. because Olga became an international connection and she's, she remains an international, uh, international um, um, presenter um, uh, in, in, in that circuit, um, yeah. not just in Chile, but also throughout Europe. Uh, the yeah. Directors 21 was also another thing, you know, it made it easier to fit with these international directors because they understood the idea of, uh, of, of culture, the idea of, uh, of a vision. Um, and they don't look, they never looked at uh, her coming from the United States. They looked at her as coming from California, right? Um, and California uh, has this allure outside of the country that most people don't understand or see or exposed to because uh, we live in the United States of America, not just California. Yeah, absolutely. And before yeah, no, we get too deep into that, I want to make sure that everybody else gets a chance to jump into yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I do want to touch on the international stuff as well. Yes. Yeah. And, I, I, you know, just just that. I mean, her DNA was 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 basically formed in the theater. Yeah. Uh, with absolutely. the social with with uh, with uh, with socialist social justice um, and uh, a larger cause and a larger artistic vision. That's which right. Is, is really her her grounding. Yeah. Kind of the ground on which she, her root, her rooting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Who would love to jump in and kind of share their mantra that really stuck with them? Concha down the street. Okay, De <laughs> Deborah, why don't you talk about Concha? <laughs> I want to talk about Concha down the street. <laughs> jump in, jump in. <laughs> um, it, it's this uh, sense of, you know, she was a person who never ever forgot where she came from and at the same time, understood the placement of that kind of uh, testimony of community folk, but also she was the, the, the torch singer to take our work, our stories, our narrative, our visuals into a wider audience. So when you talk about international, I mean, she refers to a moment uh, in a keynote speech that another keynote speech that she gave in which I think she's in, I think she's in uh, Paris or France somewhere and she's the only American that's there. And some lady comes up to her and says, I'm sorry, wh why are you here? <laughs> and, uh, and she didn't take it personally, like she didn't belong there. It's just that, you know, uh, uh, 
folks from the United States never found themselves in that context. But she said that the woman looked at her and said, you're from uh, California, Los Angeles. So it wasn't the United States. It was that Los California, Los Angeles was like its own country. <laughs> I think Just that, like what Didi is saying, yeah. <laughs> and I think that joie de vie of, you know, the fabulousness of her, uh, it was, it was Im imbued in, in how she lived, the circle of friends that she had, the work that she was so passionate about, that she, uh, that everything, you know, I, I think, I don't know why I'm thinking about Malcolm as I'm doing this, but, <laughs> you know, you know she, throwing the scarf around her neck. It's like she really enveloped all of those beautiful stories and people and uh, and even Concha down the street. Even Concha, <laughs> we need uh, the Concha. But I'll just say one thing is uh, uh, I love JD and they, they were like my family, she's my best friend. But to see JD in that room, cause I haven't been able to go back to Echo Park since you know late April, but that's the room where she, we, we would come and we would eat. And, we, and many of you who are on this uh, panel and, 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 and in the room with us, you know, you had New Year's Eve parties there with her and JD, but that's where I uh, played Scrabble with her. I mean, I, I think we did it for 20 years. And, you know, the last game, uh, she won. So I said, just feel good, Di. You're, you're, you're a champion of the world, 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 world. <laughs> and, uh, but I went back today to look at stuff, you know, from our days at, at uh, Borderlands. And um, I don't know, it's just, yeah. I have so much goodness and lessons uh, from her. And, but it's really her generosity of spirit, as JD says, that Absolutely. was so infectious and uh, she believed in me in a way that I didn't believe in myself. Mm. So uh, I applaud her tenacity. I learned from that. For sure. I agree with that a hundred percent. I feel the exact same way. I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, she would give me advice and I just turn my chair and be like, okay, I'm going to take the advice and text this person, but I'm not going to let you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, which she totally saw every time and called me out. <laughs> And so um, I hope that answers you. Yes, question. yes, Deborah. Thank you. Um, why don't we do Malcolm and then Olga? Yeah, immediately subvert the rules was immediately in my spirit. And yes. if you knew Diane, like I know Diane, um, we were always plotting. Diane knew that this country um, and even the, the the American theater was established, um, and it was not established with BIPOC artists and people in mind. And so when you enter a place that you have not been thought of, you have to, in order to make space for you, subvert rules that were not created with you in mind. Um, I think of, I think of, you know, Langston Hughes poem, I Too, um, that talks about, you, you know, you may not see me now, but when I'm at the table and I'm eating with you, You'll, you, you won't be able to deny me. You'll see how beautiful I am and you'll be ashamed. Mm. And so I, I, I love that Diane also in subverting those rules knew what it meant to be able to strategize within that. And I, I think we're seeing right now in this country and the world, the importance of that that you can be subversive, but that subversion has to have some organization to it, right? It cannot just be wholly um, lived in an emotion. There has to be direction, strategic um, direction. And I learned all of that from her. Mm -hmm. I learned it. I, I, rem I, I remember moments thinking, wow, that was really cold-blooded what just happened to her in right. this place. And I would get angry mm. and she would say, Malcolm, honey, <laughs> you, 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 you gotta be careful. And she was concerned about my health because she saw the stress level, right? But what I learned was that you have to live to fight another day. And that, um, I, I just think even this moment is a complete um, 
manifestation of her brilliance and her legacy. And um, yeah, for those who doubted her yesterday, today, or forevermore, shame on you. And um, it was your loss. Wow, that's right, that's right. And also speak truth to power too. I mean, I think that's also part of subver subverting the rules, right? Is I think we, we tend to monitor or silence ourselves. And she was like, I'm not about that life. <laughs> um, Olga, why don't you take us home with this question in terms of the mantras? Okay, so um, I'm sort of melding the last two, the most talented artists need drive ambitious and ambition and business sense would subvert the rules. I love it. <laughs> what I'm going to um, talk about is I think uh, what Diane was able to glean from her experience at El Teatro Campesino was the whole, um, the whole belief in ensemble work and collaborative work and giving various and diverse people voice. And through that artistry, um, a more perfect union could be found and, and work that was not just the purview of an individual playwright or a director who was, you know, rethinking what a playwright intended. This was something that was created really as, as, a, a, as, a, as a community that was committed to each other and its artistry. Um, so, so, so that's sort of her mm -hmm. genesis and that's where um, her grounding was. I think where the subvert the rules um, component comes in for me was that she was able to take that and was um, sort of mindful and strategic enough to take that to say, in order for me to help these artists gain voice, I have to create a resource pool that will allow me to have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that she was uh, pleading with CTG, Center Theater Group, where she worked for like 23 years. She wasn't coming in and saying, oh, please, please, please let me do these works. No, she articulated and was powerful enough to conceptualize this vision of what a new American, and I mean American in the largest sense of that mm -hmm. word, what is American theater in the 20th, late 20th and early 21st century? And she was able to go to the Mellon Foundation and say, this is the new way. This is the only way that American theater will be able to resonate in a majority minority new world for our country and so she was able to bring resources together in the millions of dollars yep. in the millions of dollars and and was able to go back to ctg and say i have the resources to give people voice mm -hmm. and so that was not only brilliant but it was like groundbreaking i think that the the um the resources that she was able to gather from the from the Mellon Foundation primarily um, allowed CTG, but it was really Diane. It wasn't CTG. It was fucking Diane, right? Uh, <laughs> Single-handedly, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she said, "I'm going to commission these new works. I'm going to commission these new works. I'm going to bring these new voices to the table. I'm going to produce." this work in a way that it hasn't been produced before. And the other thing that I would add is that, you know, very proudly, um, I was able to work with Diane and Mark Murphy and Mark Russell mm -hmm. to create Radar LA. And Radar LA was really about um, putting ensemble-based LA artists on the same platform with nationally and internationally recognized ensembles, theater ensembles. And it was just, you know, a meeting of the minds. And it was, you know, again, um, as a Latina myself coming in and saying, I'm the head of the Department of Cultural Affairs. I'm going to put money into this enterprise because I think it's an important thing to say that LA artists have the same stature and the same level of 
um, power and, and, and creativity as their um, brother and sisters from, you know, the national scene or the international scene. So to me, the, the, the beauty of Diane was that she could translate uh, what was a, a, a very deeply held artistic uh, prowess and then turn that into a um, monetized, you know, operationalized um, mode that really could bring a multiplicity of voices to the table. And for that, I'll be ever grateful. Wow, yes, that actualization, right? Just the, yeah. the, 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 the vision to have it and then to make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Usually people rare. either you know, a, have a really strong artistic voice or have a very strong sort of administrative and business voice, but uh, finding individuals that have both and can be true to both and mm -hmm. successful of both, um, you know, that's a home run. That's right. That's right. Um, something that we're really exploring in this conference, you know, and something that um, not just uh, LTLA, but LTC, the Latinx Theater Commons, is really uh, focusing on this year, um, or well, forever, it's a life to work, is really committing ourselves to anti-racism and anti-Blackness, particularly as a Latinx community. Um, Diane herself always dedicated um, herself in this fight and in this conversation. Um, her legacy lessons are really birthed right now, I think, in this moment, like JD was referencing earlier. I can't tell you how many folks have uh, told me, oh, if Diane was here right now, I, I would love to hear what she had to say. Um, and I know, Malcolm, you kind of wanted to take this question um, and everybody else could kind of fall in after if you have thoughts, um, but what would Diane, <laughs> not that you could speak for her, but what would Diane offer in today's moment, particularly around these conversations around race? Well, I, I first feel like we have to remember that Diane saw, she saw the human being, she saw your humanity first. Mm -hmm. And I think what we are dealing with right now have been centuries of people's humanity not even being acknowledged. What does it mean to not acknowledge another human being's mm. humanity? And so first we have to ask ourselves and not just, you know, you know, BIPOC, I'm just, everybody has to ask ourselves, how do we not look and, and, and investigate and love and appreciate another human being? The reason why Diane and I just clicked is because I never thought, I never in her presence, uh, in working with her through the ups, the downs, the, the challenges, the tension, I never had to explain who I was as a black man in her presence. Mm -hmm. She accepted and received me for who I was on all terms, whatever that looked like, whatever it sounded like, however I was. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me a space to fully be myself with her. Mm -hmm. Yes. And she was fully herself with me. Mm. And we embraced each other in a way and accepted each other in a way that we learned from one another. So I see that and I say to myself, oh, well, that's why she would ask me to be a consultant on a project with the historic El Teatro Campesino. Because she understood that I recognized that we were looking at humanity. Now we recognize that we all have these construct, these constructs of, of, of race and ethnicity and gender and whatnot, but ultimately we could connect on the human level. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think is powerful. Even when you look at this space and her legacy that um, Diane was, 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 was able to connect with everyone. But I think that is because she saw them first. I absolutely agree with that. I can't even tell you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, we would fly to New York for under the radar every year. And, you know, I'm born and raised here in LA, East LA, never really went to New York growing up. And she would, JD and her would run circles around me and I would get sick every year, but it was this generous spirit where she's like, we need to toughen you up. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, you know, 
it, it's this generosity again, right? Of seeing the human, letting me know that I'll get there, you know, like I'll get there, but that it was like taking care of me first as a person. Mm-hmm. So I'll never forget that. Any other folks want to jump in on this question in terms of like, what would Diane say to this kind of racial unrest at this moment? I think that the all of the fervor that's happening, all of the, the you know, the activation of looking at injustice and fighting for something, just just the feeling that all of us are having as a as a as a country and as a city, now would have been the time for her ideas to really flourish. Mm-hmm. And so as I look to all of you right now, I'm looking at Patricia and I'm looking at Malcolm. And you are her mentees. That was one of the things she was really big about really adamant about who is the next generation who's going to take this shit on and fight and who's going to be the articulate entity that's going to you know not be uh apologetic but just get you know it's malcolm says it really beautifully just to be able to get to that sense of humanity but getting to that sense of humanity for diane was also I mean, th- there was a there was a, a a fight to that bite, you know, to to want to make sure that she that she that she left something. Mm-hmm. And I look at all of us. We're, we're I mean, she lives in all of us every day in some way or another. And but I'm really looking at you and Malcolm. And I'm I'm hoping the future Malcolms, the future Patricias, the future Dianes that they, uh, that, I mean, if anything you're gonna learn, if you get to see her full keynote is stop at nothing. Do not ask for permission, just go. And ask, it's that whole old adage, you know, ask for permission later. And, uh, but just go. You got this one life, you know, what are you gonna do with it? It's like Mary Oliver, you know, what you have this one precious life, what will you do with it? And I felt that so profoundly with her always, but more profoundly, certainly in the last few years. And, and it was never like being around her, like, oh, I wonder if this is gonna be the last time blank or the, you know, and the, the, the conversation was still vibrant to the bitter end and the things that she was wanting to fight for. And I think it's up to all of us to carry that forward and, but, don't feel, don't be apologetic. Just get the fuck out there and do it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I also want to take a moment and, and I wouldn't want to leave anybody out, but I do think I would be remiss if I didn't also acknowledge um, some of the other uh, amazing folks that she has mentored, Alexander Meda, Jesus Reyes, Chantal Rodriguez, and Armando Wipe. So I know they're here with us today. So I just wanted to say thank you um, for sharing space and for uh, sharing that time with Diane as well. You all were very precious to her. I think that um, I just wanted to add one thing that we Please. talked about before the panel um, uh, came together was that, you know, her sense of being a mentor was so critical to who she was as a human being. And she touched so many people's lives. But I think one thing that she would say right now if she was here is that all of them, those mentees, need to mentor someone else yes it's not a one-way thing it is uh ingrained in your ethos and it is about you know i got this from diane how can i give this to somebody who's coming into the field and that generosity um needs to be really um you know, multi-generational, it, it's not just a one-way street. And uh, that's something that I think she would absolutely endorse. Yeah. And absolutely. you know, Olga, part of that is not just having coffee, but offering real opportunities, right? Diane, when I was working someplace else, called me and said, come work with me, right? So, you know, even in my current work, I'm constantly looking at how do I find work opportunities? And then those opportunities become my 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 chance to 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 mentor but you know i i think for so long um the the mentor mentee relationship 
has um, in some ways not been long-term beneficial beyond a conversation. Yeah. And Definitely. you need to provide access yeah. to your mentees. You need to provide them a leg up. You need to, when I think about mentee and mentorship, I, all of my mentees, I am constantly trying to elevate them even above myself. Yes. Because that to me is legacy. It's not about being insecure and thinking that they're going to take over the world. No, it's about, no, once I have run my race, it's now for you, time for you to take the baton and you need to be equipped and uh, ready to run that race even faster than me so that as we get to that finish line, we win and we win uh, in, in a huge way. That is so great. And I feel I, I really, I really tried to model that from Diane, you know, and I really tried to just, even if it's just as simple as, especially right now, a text, a care package, a moment to say, I'm thinking of you, I see you, I see your humanity. And I try to do that with all of the folks that I mentor as well. And just also just acknowledge you matter to me. <laughs> and I know that even if in arts and particularly in predominantly white institutions, it's hard to remember that our value. I, I, wanna, I, I think yeah, the, ahead, the um, your your way of mentoring is obviously a reflection of who you are, and you know it's a place to it's not to uh to, it's a place to download and upload, mm -hmm. you know at the same right. time, and um, uh, the people that I mentor, if anything that is consistent, is a belief in them, because that can go a long way. That. They have a space to flourish. They have a place to, for failure, but at the same time, they have someone will, who will have their back and who will, and they, that sounds cliche, but someone to, you know, they can always come back to. Mm -hmm. Some of the people that I mentored, you know, even at Spark so many years ago are still within my sphere and within my, you know, and if anything, they, they're, I think that our connection as mentor mentee, it made both and both of us better people, mm -hmm. and um, but yeah, I, I and I th I loved hearing Diane's uh, stories about you know who who was next or who was giving who was who was giving making a making an influence or uh, and it wasn't so much like who was rising to the top but who had the bite, you know, in them. And that was, uh, that was great to witness. Yes, and also I think that does tie back to the mantra of subvert the rules. When we have a, a society and a system that pits ourselves against each other in competition and instead to choose the generous spirit and to choose the way of mentorship and opening that door, I think that directly kind of applies to that. I want to start taking questions to folks in just a second. So get those questions ready, put them in the chat, put them, um, raise those hands, uh, put them on the social media channels and our amazing tech team will help me out here. But I wanted to uh, just hear one last time from JD before the question started. JD, I really want to reflect a little bit on this first mantra. Um, when do you give a little so you can get a lot? How do, we have a lot of artists here today. And so I also want to maybe you could speak as an artist yourself. How do artists need to balance that tension between compromise and vision? <laughs> that, that, that's a big question. It's I mean, a big question. <laughs> well, it's, it's big because, um, you know, at one level, writers are told sometimes, you know, well, don't compromise. You can't compromise your vision, right? Uh, um, it's, especially if you're going to go into, but, but which is, I don't know if that's bad advice, to be honest with you, because um, uh, you see, I mean, I once had an opportunity to, and, and Malcolm, this is this is this is his new hallway now, is at, at Disney Parks where people are conceptualizing, you know, um, new rides or how to, you know, deal with a space or something, you know, and and there are so many people sitting around the table, and everybody has an idea, and um, you know. Um, What's her name? Hamburger. Um, Anne Hamburger. Anne. 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 Yeah. Anne, Anne, this is this is Annie's regime at the time, and she's sitting there. She's a theater person, and you know she's like monitoring and you know talking, uh, basically um, uh, 
um, uh, leading the discussion and there's a big vision and um, it, how is everybody contributing to this? And, and it, it was a pretty amazing collaborative thing to watch actually. And I hadn't seen that kind of energy since I was in the teatro. Um, and, um, uh, you know, and, and this individualist, individ, people being in, you know, sort of independent individuals with an idea and the vision, and this is how it should be, be done. And because of the writer, the actors are going to ruin my vision, or, you know, the director is going to turn it someplace else. Um, I, I think it's kind of, it, to me, is toxic. Um, it can be toxic. Um, and, um, the generosity of spirit again. Um, how do you give a little to take to take a lot, right? I mean, that's right. Um, getting back to that, I mean, that's that becomes the paradox in in a way. That becomes the dialectic. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that we did in the teatro a lot, actually, during a certain period, maybe for about two years, is that we were studying very, very, um, referring very, very heavily to Mao's on contradictions, right? Um, and don't ask me a question about Miles on, on <laughs> because I would remember, but I think, but you know, it certainly goes back into, it certainly becomes part of your subconscious, right? And, you know, there is a huge contradiction in our lives, right? There is a dialectic. Um, you give a little, you take back, you know, you take mm -hmm. back, you give a little, you know, there's that kind of a thing going on. And this is, again, um, give a little to an individual as a mentor, you know, yeah. And it comes back to you. Um, this is the idea of, um, of in la catch, right? This is the idea yes. of tu eres mi otro yo, right? You are my other self. Um, and um, again, this was another, another, this was another um, mantra that we had in the teatro, understanding what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to understand, for example, um, the idea of looking at ind indigenous uh, philosophies and uh, the metaphysics mm -hmm. and trying to decolonize ourselves in the process, right? Um, trying not to be Eurocentric, right? Yep. Uh, taking inspiration from our uh, indigenous roots because mm -hmm. we're basically all Native Americans, um, you know, get your DNA test, you know, Diane took her DNA test and she was like, guess what? 50% Native, 56% Native. We right? took those together and we had, <laughs> We had like almost the same. <laughs> there was had, uh, Patricia and Dolores and myself and and Diane. We all took our DNA. Yeah, yeah you know, I we mean, we all came on. back and said, "Oh my God, we're you know, I was forty six percent Native American because I'm a native of New Mexico." But yeah, well, you know. you know, and there you go. And then then and so there's a little bit of that. I mean, and and then you try to understand what that means, and and you realize mm -hmm. that, wow, okay, um, as opposed to say. Generally speaking, just being really general, uh, white America didn't have the same experiences as, as those of us in Latin America. In Latin America, we were the tormentor and we married the, the, the people that we were tormenting. And in our blood now runs the blood of both the tormentor and mm. the tormented, right? So we have this huge thing going on inside of us genetically um, that, uh, uh, Sometimes people say, well, that's your cousin's you know, confusion, but I like to see, I, I like to see, think that it's, uh, 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 it, it's almost poetic justice in some ways, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and my, my mother-in-law did her genetic test and, you know, and she found out that she was like, you know, a small percentage of Ghana, you know, the Congo and Portuguese. And you're wondering, Okay, there's where okay, there's a little bit of a Portuguese slaver going in there. It might have had, you know, something going on in the slave ship, and then here goes the genetic here here goes the Portuguese with the uh, with the African American and, and you know, through the yeah. centuries <laughs> you you get this yeah. mix, right? Right. So yeah. <laughs> it's it it it's again giving a little to to get to get to get more. I mean, understanding that, understanding uh, uh, to Malcolm's point uh, about humanity. Yeah. Uh, and that we all have a shared experience, um, you know, is, uh, is something that we don't really ponder, I think, as much as we should. I mean, how can you, how can you seriously want to do harm or exclude something from a, something, whether it's a, a, a voice uh, in, in a room, 
um, when the person that's across from you is basically has the sum total of thousands of years of coupling and genetic sort of sharing, right? Mm. I mean, and there, all of us are survivors, right? And um, we should respect that. We should respect the fact that we're here as survivors and we're, we're trying as a civilization and as a community and as humanity to continue to evolve. Um, and um, how, that, how, that, how that reflects in the work you know, certain things resonate for you and others don't. I mean, I remember Diane used to want to meet all the time when we were in New York uh, going to Under the Radar. She'd always want to see uh, the latest Young Jean Lee, you know, sort of workshop. Her favorite. <laughs> and and I, uh, to be honest with you, there were a couple of times I was like, hi, Diane, really? I mean, <laughs> it's not accessible. I we won't tell it. Young Jean. We won't tell. <laughs> oh, don't tell her. Oh, no. But, you know, she was coming from a very specific, you know, sort of, uh, feminine, you know, sort of point of view, Asian, that it resonated for her, you know, and, uh, it, and it sort of, she evolved into the playwright that, you know, did the show on Broadway, which she helped along the way, you know, Absolutely. Um, group, yeah. and, and, and about men, about white men. Straight Did white men. <laughs> <laughs> um, and again, it was just give, this is an artist who has a vision, you know, let's support her in a little way. You know, we'll give her a small commission and see where it goes. And maybe it'll pay off, maybe it won't, but it, it's gonna help her along on her path and her journey, right? That's giving a little to, to gain a lot. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Um, but I also think in that spirit of giving a little, people, people need to give up their ego. <laughs> and, I mean, really, I mean, I think a healthy ego is good, but it, when you, you, I think that's one thing that she was so, you know, if you can just have an honest conversation about what is it that you really want to do? What is it that you really want to get across? Just talk to me, just, you know, without the, you know, without the, all of the uh, gibberish, just, mm -hmm. you know, and I think getting to the essence of, you know, when you think about somebody who, who believed in your humanity, but imagine believing in your humanity and also believing in the story that you wanted to tell on the stage. So yeah. all that, that was a, it was a continual rhythm in her to be able to, um, you know, to apply that in a variety of ways. But, uh, you know, th there was no room for people's ego. You know, there's no room for arrogance. There's, you know, let's just get to the essence of what we have to do here. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. I wanna open it up for questions. Um, I see a couple hands, um, but I do wanna honor, we have Armando Wipe, one of Diane's, um, mentors uh, mentees here so Martha if you want to come on camera and I'm gonna um I think you are unmuted hi uh good to see you good to be here uh thank you for holding this space um I I just wanted to share a little bit about um in thinking about like what I've been thinking about recently with Diane and um about Diane and our time together and I I got to meet her when I was a freshman at UCLA I was 18 and I was like a shy little queer brown boy taking the gay Tino class with Dan Guerrero at UCLA. <laughs> we love and you, Dan. <laughs> we love you, Dan. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, and I, I, I've been reflecting on like I, how much time I spent being intimidated by Diane, but that entire time that I did, she was supporting me that whole time. And um, I think it was, Deborah, you were saying she had your back. And like, I, I always felt that with Diane for sure. Um, and, and taking on, uh, I, I just took on the, the new position at the LTC, my new position, and um, we were at TCG together and she had this like little plan, like let's get together with Alex Meda at Teatro Luna. Um, let's try to make it a weekly thing as much as we can. Uh, and, and we did, we, we, we were meeting weekly. We got a pretty good rhythm going and we would just like unpack issues of the day and unpack issues mm -hmm. in our careers that we were facing and in at, at just like the day-to-day -day work that we were doing and um, about subversion that a lot of the times it's, it can, it can seem small at like at face value and it, or it happens behind the scenes. And um, it, she, all, like there, every action that she took, however big or small had so much power in it and she imbued it with so much power that, um, now I, I've been thinking about revisiting a lot of my memories with her and in that phase when I was too intimidated to really like really accept um, the relationship that we were building that um, 
that there was so much in there still for me to like mine and learn from and and yeah I just wanted to share share that and about you know it, in every moment she had it seemed like she was she had a plan oh my gosh thank but you even so after much you left you know Armando and you applied for the job for the uh the how round uh the the Latinx theater comments Latinx yeah theater. Uh, uh, I mean, even before you got the job, I knew you got the job. So, but you, you were somebody that she really, really believed in. And she gave a whole list of reasons why. And within that context of believing in you, it's never to say that you were perfect, but that there was room always for expansion and, and you know, um, that we're, you know, we're all learners, all of us. So, but she was a huge fan. For sure. Yes, okay. absolutely. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm going to go take our next question. Uh, Leah, if you want to uh, come on camera. Normally, I would, my friend. Oh, okay. um, but, um, <laughs> Stay hidden. Stay I'll, hidden. I'll, I'll admit question. humanity, I'm having massive mask acne outbreak situation. Okay, let, let's, let's just do the question then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So my question for anyone who would like to speak on it was, um, you know, my interaction with Diane was more on like the big scale, like bigger events, bigger things, large gatherings. And for those who are have intimate moments with her and intimate memories, what were the things that made Diane super gleeful and joyful or gave her the deep, deep belly laughs? Those kinds of things. <laughs> Who would like to take that? <laughs> say it, Joe, what do you say? What do you say? <laughs> Uh, it's not fair because I, you know, I've said, I, I, I'm the husband, so or the now widower. Um, hi, JD. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it because Diane's not here. Uh, <laughs> hi, Joe. No, I mean, I, uh, uh, well, you know, I, I was incessantly teasing her, and you know, um, uh, which would get her extremely upset, very upset, uh, and um. <laughs> You know, but it's it's in my nature. I mean, I'm in the, I'm the eldest in the family, my family of six. So I was always picking on my brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, she was the eldest of two sisters who were very very you know um, proper, um, especially with the Baptist upbringing, right? So um, very different. And uh, of course, and and I had to. I'm I'm in my good behavior right now. Um, <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> I'm terribly not PC, um, and uh, that would get her very upset. You know, you can't be saying that kind of stuff. You know, it's just like, what? You know, it's like, I go, what, what, what? What are you talking about? She's like, that's terrible. You can't be. You can't. Not, you can't act like that. And I go, look at. I'm in my 60s now. I can say whatever I want. Okay, so like, <laughs> if I, I couldn't do it when I was in my 20s and 30s, but nobody cares. They'll think I'm a crazy old man. So that's fine. So like. No, you can't do that. You're embarrassing me. You know, or there would be other other times when when I would tease her. Um, oh, I remember once when we were like in our twenties, um, and we were laying together in the bed, and I saw I saw her eyelashes, and um, well, what are these? And I started poking them, and I pulled out some of her, of her real eyelashes, <laughs> and she went through the roof. She was just so upset, you know. Um, dare I say that, she, that there was little spousal abuse there, you know, with her, <laughs> oh, um, but that would get her upset. And then, and you know, I'm then so there good. were other, uh, JD, there were, she asked about <laughs> joy, 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 joy. <laughs> <laughs> you have gone down well, it brought me there. joy. <laughs> oh Lord. <laughs> Hi, Joe. Hi, no, Joe. I'm telling you, the thing that, that really brought her joy was entertaining here at the house. Uh, yes. You know, when um, and also the, uh, the the dinners with close friends. Um, that certainly brought her joy. Uh, what brought her joy once uh, when she came back from um, New York on a on a trip, and one of her uh, one of the writers in her writers group, uh, uh, because she had she was in a writers group, uh, Bridget Carpenter. Uh, was in, was um, installed in the uh, dramatist guild, and she uh, she made it a point to be present when they uh, had the ceremony ceremony for her, and uh, she came back all excited. She's like, "We cried so much, 
just because it was it was such a wonderful moment. Uh, Bridget, Bridget, you know, was was crying and it was very emotional. And then these were tears of joy, right? So that that was something that was uh, um, a, a joyful moment for her. Uh, she really loved again um, your success, my success, kind of a thing, right? And mm -hmm. she, was, she was very happy. She was happy. She was extremely happy, um, even though. It, most people don't realize it because it was a very small thing uh, when Gol Olga uh, invited us to the French consulate where, the, where the, she was bestowed the Legion of Honor. <laughs> it's like she was very happy about that. That was just something that was extremely special. And we were happy to be involved in that, you know, mm -hmm. uh, by being invited to the event. Um, and it was such a, such a big honor. Um, Oh, and people are reminding us of her fashions in the chat, her fashions. Let's not forget oh, <laughs> her shopping and her really, fashions. Oh, yeah. Well, there was a time when she she had this uh, designer uh, in, in the garment district that uh, dealt primarily with purses, right? So, you know, we used to, she used to go there and Deborah, I think, went a couple of times in the old too. And um, uh, she bought a purse there. She came back one day and uh, she was telling me the story. I go, what happened to your purse? She's like, oh my God, what a story. Um, I, um, I was at baggage claim at JetBlue and this guy comes up to me and he says like, wow, that's a really nice purse. I says like, oh yeah, thank you. And he's like, um, where did you get it? He says like, oh, I got it in Los Angeles. Ah. Huh. So he was there with an assistant and then he comes back and says like, that is really a nice purse. Can I buy it from you? <laughs> Well, no, no, it's not for sale. It's 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 one of my favorite purses. He's like, well, I'm in the purse business, a bag business, right? So how about if I offer you $300 for it, right? And then she goes, really? <laughs> she says, yeah, I'll give you $300 for that purse. And uh, so she says, well, okay. So she takes herself out of her purse and um, packs it up and she collects $300 and came back with the $300. She was so worried that somebody's going to rip off the design. Finally, she went to the designer and confessed and she goes, Oh honey, don't worry about it. They ripped that off that design a long time ago. You know, uh, <laughs> the other thing that brought her great joy um, uh, were actors. Actors were yes. uh, actors. She loved actors um, and, uh, and uh, performers, actors, especially, um, and she knew how to work with actors because she was an actress and she knew all the insecurities, she knew, she knew, you know, um, how to draw performances out of actors. Um, some directors, you know, were maybe, maybe a little bit, you know, f lacking in that area. Sometimes, you know, the directors, sometimes if they're too hard and they don't know how to massage, um, uh, the psychology of a, of a performer, uh, the actor will shut down and not deliver. And uh, mm -hmm. she knew how to work with actors. And she also knew how to work with writers. And um, a good scene, is, you know, was uh, was also something that she loved working with, uh, mm -hmm. from you know, getting a new scene from a, from a writer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, those are a couple of- a couple of I love it, I love it. Well, we, we're almost at time. I wanna take the last couple of questions. Um, Henry, I'm gonna- say what gave her joy was oh. uh, her mother, <laughs> Helen. Yes, and her nephew Mario and Gabby and Bell and Leo and Jacob and Jude. Um, yes, and we have been a, spending lots of time with them. <laughs> yes, she loved being an aunt for sure, an aunt and a great aunt. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Thank you oh. for saying that. All right, Henry, if you want to come on camera or not, <laughs> just great. ask. Hello, question. hello. This yes. this is the voice of Henry. Can we you hear you. Hear okay, perfect. Um, I I tried to start the video, but it's not letting me. It's okay. Oh, Go okay. ahead and just jump yeah, in. Yeah. So my question is for anybody on the panel. Um, oh, they're letting me. Look. Oh. Yeah. Hello. I'm alive. <laughs> we can see. Um, my question is for anybody on the panel is, what's some advice on subverting the rules? Or if you have any of Diane's advice that she would give us on subverting the rules. So anybody can answer this. <laughs> Um, Olga, we haven't heard from you in a little bit. Do you want to chime in? <laughs> I think that um, having a sense of um, inner uh, strength and knowing that you do have a seat at the table and that you are just as good as anyone else, don't be cowed by power. Mm. Mm. Really, really go in there and just say, I am 
who I am and I'm bringing something that none of you possess. I am bringing a sense of um, sort of community intelligence and power that you need from me to get this organization going. And so it's like flipping, it's like Kung Fu. It's like power Kung Fu of just saying, I am the one that is giving the power. I'm not taking power from you. I am giving you power. And so I think that that whole sense of just flipping the paradigm uh, is really uh, the only way to go and, and have success. <clears throat> And she would do that move, Olga. <laughs> Another thing that she would always, you know, that, that, that it was part of her too, was like, uh, if you can't beat them, join them and lead them. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She also said that uh, resisting the true, resisting the tried and true ways, don't get stuck on, uh, you know, that it has to be this way. That you that you have the room to learn and to and to even give it to yourself in a different way. So, but also that um, one of the things that that was in the video in the keynote was that she was a rebel who can politic, and I think that's really important. You know, she never abandoned, you know, her capacity to to. You know, she says it so beautifully in the in the video that you guys are going to watch. Hopefully, yeah. I just want to add one last thing, and and that's yeah. that um, she was very clear on her sense of being a woman. Yes, all of that 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 connotes. And I just want to give a shout out. There's a number of um, our colleagues from the women's working yes, group thank you, Olga. to to this session, and uh, they've been texting the whole time and uh diane was a very critical part of the women's working group a group of about 15 to 20 women in the performing arts uh, artists administrators funders uh heads of national foundations etc and um we come together once a year uh to talk about both personal and professional issues and i just want to give a shout out to the women's working group because I know that that was another um, forum that uh, Diane cared deeply about. So very much. But I think that you know that whole sense of I am a woman and I am bringing um, you know sort of the best in the sense of traditional women's thinking, giving, um, nurturing, um, home you know, all of those wonderful qualities that women bring to the table, she brought that to her leadership. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And she, she also yeah. says about that women's group that it really uh, was one of the steps that catapulted her because of the advice that she got from so many of you in that group and that she learned so much about herself and that she was, uh, I mean, it, it, it was, it was, it was like another realm of sisterhood for sure for her. Mm -hmm. I think Malcolm wanted to jump in, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to, you know, people are asking how, you know, how did she subvert? Part of the subversion was whatever people thought that she couldn't do was her power. Yeah. yeah. So it, if people make assumptions about you, which you can or cannot do, and also when being told no, realizing that there's somebody who will say yes and going and finding that. Um, I, I think subversion doesn't necessarily always have to be some nefarious moment that, that went down, right? <laughs> it, it could be a complete, um, again, it's we, a lot of people have said this is about being strategic. Yes. And when people doubt you, that is when you actually now have the upper hand because you have the ability to prove them not only wrong, but to, you know, maybe set yourself up to, to come back with some ability to negotiate. Thank awesome. you, Henry. Thank you. Shout out to Malcolm. I was a cast member for years at Disneyland. <laughs> I was a tour guide. Okay, I'm getting off now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, folks, we are at time. I cannot believe it. This just went so quickly. Um, I did want to acknowledge there were some questions on social media about um, how Team Diane 
uh, is undertaking maybe some of Diane's unfinished business that JD had referenced. And yes, we meet every other week, folks. It is a, <laughs> we have a business meeting to talk about Diane. Yeah. So yeah. We, uh, her uh, board article that JD referenced earlier is going to be published through Theater Communications Group shortly. We are working on a series with them to honor more of her legacy. We have the memorial that we're hoping or the celebration of life that we're hoping to host. Um, uh, Janine Salinas and Hannah Kim are doing a commission that they uh, already started pre um, Diane's passing at Yale Rep. Um, so they are, are living and, and carrying on her legacy. So there's so many ways folks and, and I encourage people to go to Diane's website. You can Google it. Um, it, you know, I, if I can find it quickly, I'll put it in the chat, but, um, just stay in touch. We, we love you. We thank you for being here. I just want to take a moment to acknowledge, uh, Deborah, Malcolm, Olga, and of course, JD. Thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you, Patricia. Yes. And check out the Latinx Theater Alliance, uh, LA, and they're doing amazing things all weekend. Thank, thank you all. Happy love you. Time. <laughs> Love you all. We're just going to bask thank in this you. chat. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Christina. Christina put the website in the chat. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And if you want to come off video and, and shout out, please feel free while you're exiting. <laughs> that was great, Patricia. You did fantastic. Yeah, you did great, Patricia. Really? Thank uh, you. Really? You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> well, for what? But you're hired. <laughs> oh, and thank you to our techs. They were really yeah. keeping us on track there. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Curtis. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Ms. Blanca. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. That was so helpful to get all those tidbits. Thank you, Minerva. I appreciate this very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful tribute to our dear Diane. Yeah, you guys. Glad I am. Yeah. <laughs> lady, lady, die. Lady, yeah. die. Yeah. We're grateful that all of you came on and decided to be with us tonight. It was meant. I think it meant a lot to everyone. Thank yeah. you. Well, it meant a lot to me too. Thank you. Mm. And I want to save this chat if you can. Uh, oh, Jessica! Yay! <laughs> oh, she went away. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know Mercedes and Anthony if we could save the chat for um, our, our team, Diane. This is, is it, being, this is being this, recorded, right? Yeah. yeah. This is being recorded, but the chat is also so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I can save it. Yep, I can save the chat. Oh, okay, great. Thank when you. When will people get to see this live stream? Uh, that's a how round question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'd like my mother-in-law to watch it with, because uh, my yeah. Yeah, Oh, yes. Kick. Yeah. I think she'd get a kick. If it's on our Facebook, it's it'll be on there. Oh, okay. okay. Armando, it's on Facebook already? Yeah, it's it's oh, okay. live streamed on Facebook currently. Perfect. Okay. So you could go to Facebook to watch it, I think. Yeah, it'll be saved after it's done. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. I, I do I just have to acknowledge there have been there were so many people in this room who yeah. were connected to Diane. It is just incredible. Yeah. I'm looking at this room and I'm like, this is this is my homework. Yes. <laughs> impact this many people who represent humanity yes i mean i think if there's anything we can learn you know oftentimes so many of us uh, are so focused on these sort of career what am i going to do what am I, you know and to just have an impact on people yeah is extraordinary to me that is true legacy that's true success so i'm just i'm blown away you know um and this is this is so beautiful to me to yeah. just be able to see all this love in the room and to just see how she's impacted so many people in the world and left us so much. She's yeah. left us so much to move forward. So thank yeah. you again to this. Thank you, everybody. Body. Yes, and we're gonna, we're gonna end the Howl Round feed uh, now. And then if folks want to stay on the Zoom and say hello, we're happy to do that. But I just wanted to formally end the live stream portion <laughs> so we're not blasting out our business <laughs> thank you Thea thank you Latinx Theater Commons Armando everyone thank you thank you bye bye bye, bye Olga oh Olga left us oh, okay.
Well, I love everybody's photos. Let me just start there. <laughs> They're wonderful. I know, oh, I know Dolores is still on here and I just want to give her a shout out because uh, Diane and her and me, we were called uh, Las Tres Ds. And uh, <laughs> we would have such great excursions and um, I don't think we, either one of us have brought ourselves yet to go do that again yet. So, mm. but someday soon, I hope so for sure. All right. Well, I think we're still live, so I think maybe we'll just all sign oh. up. <laughs> okay. Okay. Love, Love you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. See you. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you. Love you. Love you. Thank you, Patricia, for helping us. Of course. Always. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Do you want to come to some of the um, panels? No, I'm coming to the. Um, I'm coming to the. Uh, the six o'clock. Yes. Okay. So I'll be there. Yay. Okay, good night. Good night. Thank you. Oh, there's Shantae. <laughs>